Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this block, we'll be fairly short and succinct, I hope, uh, just talking a bit about stimulants and their use for ADHD. And also, as a related topic, at least historically, stimulants were used for weight management for patients with obesity. So we'll briefly talk about obesity management here. So we'll review how some of the, you know, in very basic terms, how the stimulants work and why we use them where we use them. Uh, to start with, let's talk about a couple of common stimulants that you may be familiar with. The first one I think of, and of course, you know, is ubiquitous in our society, and I'll be the first to tell you I'm a caffeine-aholic, in a sense, um, the methylxanthines, including caffeine, theobromine, and theophylline. Uh, of the three, the caffeine has the, probably the most CNS stimulation associated with them. Uh, caffeine itself associated with some cardiovascular uh, effects, including maybe slight elevated heart rate, but central nervous system as well, you'd expect to see uh, increased level of alertness, uh, and you might see some relaxationist uh, bronchioles. That's primarily how it's re the related drug, theophylline, will work. It's also a pretty effective diuretic, uh, at least it causes diuresis at least, but we don't really use caffeine for its diuretic purposes. Uh, it does have some effects in folks who have uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, sort of worsening the LES tone, the lower esophageal sphincter tone there. Uh, it may also increase some stomach acid secretion. So caffeine is not it, uh, the perfect uh, agent by any means, but it has become pretty ubiquitous in our society. Nicotine is another kind of interesting drug. Nicotine, depending on its level and uh, its properties, can either have a, uh, a modest relaxation effect or a little bit of a stimulating effect. Uh, and so both with nicotine and with caffeine, there are specific withdrawal symptoms that are noted when you withdraw from caffeine, it's usually a headache. With uh, nicotine, there's the classic irritability, anxiety, restlessness, and difficulty concentrating uh, symptoms with anyone you might have ever known who tried to quit smoking, for example. The third stimulant, which clinically we don't really use except maybe you know a very limited role uh, as a vasoconstrictor, a second-line vasoconstrictor in nasal and facial trauma occasionally applied topically, uh, but that's not a very common indication. We usually use something before cocaine. Cocaine is a CNS stimulant that really affects the reuptake of neurotransmitters uh, and is associated with a highly rewarding effect uh, with its use, and so it becomes uh, has a high degree of uh, psychological and some physical uh, addictive properties. And then the amphetamines, both the ones we use legitimately and those like crystal methamphetamine as well, uh, they augment against the release of catecholamines here, particularly dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, uh, and that is responsible for uh, the action of amphetamines. Uh, amphetamines and methylphenidate, of all of these stimulants, probably amphetamines are the only one that do have a recognized medical legitimate use. Caffeine we will use, actually, and the theobromines used somewhat in medicine. Caffeine might be included in a headache prep for migraine headache because it's vasoconstrictive. Uh, theophylline is sort of a really third-line agent in bronchospastic, bronchospastic disease. But amphetamines really have their role in ADHD and maybe narcolepsy. Historically, they were also used for appetite control, but really aren't used for that. And of course, I think most of you probably recognize that there is a fair amount of amphetamine misuse or abuse, particularly I think on college campuses, we see this more often where students are cramming for an overnight exam or something and they uh, may be illegitimately using amphetamines without recognizing the consequences of that. Uh, amphetamines can cause a lot of insomnia, agitation, frank psychosis, uh, elevates heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac arrhythmia risk. Uh, it causes anorexia and decreased appetite, which is why they have historically been used for weight control, but no longer 
considered legitimate use, and contraindications are in coronary artery disease, MAO inhibitor use, patients with significant hypertension, and the like. So let's spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the main focus that you're likely to see in practice for amphetamines is attention deficit hyperactive disease. And there are guidelines available that have been published for a number of years now for children and adolescents. We are awaiting new guidelines for the management of ADHD in adults. Uh, we have seen a, you know, a fourfold increase in the use of amphetamines and the diagnosis of ADHD in adults, and yet we're lagging on having some degree of authoritative guidelines as far as how to manage ADHD in adults. So we're kind of waiting for that to happen. But here are the key points for ADHD uh, management in children. Children, uh, and these guidelines look at age 4 to age 18. Uh, and for the most part, they look at the guidelines, look at making sure you have the right diagnosis or the workup. I'll defer that to ClinMed, uh, the ClinMed cohorts to help sort of outline that with you. Uh, the diagnosis should be based on criteria for the DSM-5, uh, and uh, it often, you need to think about whether there's some other etiology or rule out in your differential to explain what is being observed. When you look at ADHD, you have to think about there might be other conditions associated with ADHD as well. So you have to think, is there an issue of, issue of post-traumatic stress? Is there uh, allergy histories? Is there something else that's contributing to it? When we look at the management of it, we typically look at trying to first start with behavioral therapy really for everyone, but particularly those below the age of five or six. Um, in those individuals, we usually, below the, you know, age four to six, we really try to avoid stimulant use at that point, in part because stimulants are associated with changes in appetite, and because of that, you might see some suppression of growth, uh, plus there's maybe cardiovascular risk. So really, in pre-age, school-age children, we look at behavioral therapy as our first choice. If agents are used, there are a couple of choices we'll talk at, uh, about, and methylphenidate has some data here. We'll talk about that. Uh, and there are a couple of agents that could be tried as well. We'll talk about these non-stimulant, non-controlled drugs for ADHD in a bit. Once you get older, uh, you know, behavioral therapy should be in line with all of it as, a, as an adjunct or as a part of or a standalone intervention. Uh, but in more severe cases, the use of uh, stimulants or non-stimulant meds for ADHD makes sense as well, and we'll talk through those, and those are that use is supported uh, by the guidelines. Uh, the other issue is that you try to titrate the dose to the lowest effective dose that will work. You periodically want to evaluate, is it working? And with the use of stimulants in particular, you always are thinking of monitoring the growth height chart chart, weight, height, weight chart, and to make sure that that individual, that child or adolescent is within the, you know, the standard bell-shaped curve of growth. And if they're lagging behind, we routinely would consider having a drug holiday for a period of a few weeks where often children's appetite increases significantly and they have a growth spurt. So one of your th thoughts might be, wait a minute. ADHD, you're recommending stimulants, and if you've known anyone with ADHD, ADHD or have it yourself, many times there's a, act, there's a hyperactivity component as well as an attention deficit component, and you're thinking, well, stimulants, that would obviously make that worse. Well, here's why that, if you truly have ADHD, that the stimulants may actually offer a benefit. Uh, the area of the brain that the reticular activating system is associated with individuals sort of recognizing what is normal in the background that you can tune out versus what is some warning or concern that you should pay attention to. So if you've ever, for example, uh, remember your first night that you spent away from home as a child, perhaps, Maybe you went to your grandparents' house or someone, a neighbor or friend's house, uh, and there was some, there was a chiming clock every 15 minutes in the other room. Or you weren't used to hearing traffic and you heard traffic. You woke up for that right away. 
and every time the clock chimed, you woke up for it. Well, that's your reticular activating system initially recognizing, hey, that's a different sound. Do you have to pay attention to this in your environment? But after you've slept in a place with that clock chiming every 15 minutes, you know, after a period of time, a couple of nights, your reticular aggregating system kind of will recognize that as normal uh, and not sort of alert you to that. It'll help you filter out that chiming clock or that thing that is not having a problem. What I often hear described for people who have ADHD is that it is hard for them to tune out the things in their environment that aren't important. Uh, and, uh, and so it's as though they were, uh, they had a bank of televisions in front of them with all their favorite TV shows on or sports shows or whatever uh, on, and they couldn't decide where to look, which TV screen to look at. Um, uh, in, in a sense, that's kind of the way that it, it's often described for folks, and it's frustrating because it's hard to keep on task with things. It interrupts uh, people's progress and social adaptiveness in school, in work, in everyday life. By, by focusing on the reticular activating system with a stimulant, that often gets improved. So we will use stimulants, and the issue you want to be clear about is do you have the right diagnosis? If they have ADHD and you give them a stimulant, typically you'll see things improve. If you give them a stimulant but they don't have ADHD, they'll actually sometimes be worse, not better. So important for you to kind of have an appreciation for that. There are lots of medicines that are available for ADHD. This and the next chart uh, will sort of outline some of them. There are different meds, active ingredients. There are different formulations uh, that are available in different doses. There's even transdermal patches that are available uh, as well. Uh, and so important, if this is a practice area you look at, you'll be familiar with what is available and on the market. Now, there are two speed bumps you've got here, in three actually. One is that most of these are Schedule two drugs, and so that requires you writing a prescription for a controlled drug following the DEA requirements. You can't write for more than 30 days at a time. There are some tricks around that for clinicians who are writing, for example, a three-month supply of ADHD meds, which is a Schedule II stimulant, if that's what you're using. Um, and the way to do that is to write prescriptions and date prescriptions uh, a, a month apart. So you might give someone three prescriptions, but they're dated different dates with different windows of time to have them filled. The pharmacy can hold on to those prescriptions and then fill them when the time is due. So there's ways around that. The second issue for you uh, is uh, evaluating uh, whether or not that market, that drug is covered by insurance. And the third one we've had a problem with in the last two years is many of the stimulants are in short supply. So they may not physically be available because of a national back order or shortage or some other problem associated with them. So um, there are a couple of speed bumps in operationally starting somebody on some of these meds. Lots of them available. Don't go memorizing these. But you'll see they fall into really two broad categories. This first table looks at methylphenidate is a stimulant. It's a non-amphetamine but similar to an amphetamine and works like an amphetamine. There's lots of methylphenidate products that are on the market. This second slide are the amphetamine derivatives, and there are many of them, and the, they're in the top three tables here. Uh, and in the bottom are the non-stimulants as well. Very hard to sort of read this table. I wouldn't worry so much about it. We've got the next couple of tables talk more specifically about the drugs, and I'm going to describe those drugs that are available in those sets of tables just coming right up. So, as we look at drugs for ADHD, first of all, there are a number of methylphenidate or Ritalin or Ritalin-like drugs on the market. They vary in their dosage formulation, what's their onset and duration of action. Ideally, what most clinicians would like to do when they're dealing with a stimulant for ADHD is to do a couple of things. First of all, work up when you're using either methylphenidate or an amphetamine. You work up that individual for, is it truly ADHD? Uh, it, are there lesser options that could be tried, behavioral, or maybe they might be a candidate 
for a non-stimulant, a non-controlled drug, perhaps. Uh, so those are considerations. And then you want to rule out if there are any contraindications to using stimulants. In pediatrics and adolescents, there aren't too many. But if there's any cardiovascular history or history of cardiovascular rhythm disturbances, you might want to consider that as the first step. The second sort of consideration, I won't necessarily call this a contraindication, but the consideration is the risk for substance abuse. Let's talk about that for just a minute. They're controlled drugs, they're Schedule II drugs, they have the potential to be abused. Now, the other side of that equation is, at least for the individual who has ADHD, if you get good control of their ADHD and they can function more readily, they actually probably will lower their risk for a future substance uh, use disorder in the future. So uh, they are, uh, you know, for the individual who has ADHD, you certainly want to safeguard against any risk for abuse or, or misuse of that drug uh, by that individual. Uh, you want to safeguard it. You want to make sure that there's a, you know, the parent or guardian, if you're talking about adults or the adult who has ADHD who's using it, has a means to keep it secure, uh, that they only have access to it, or the child, you know, the parent who is responsible or has access to it. A second consideration is an evaluation of everyone else in the household. So, for example, if the child you're treating with ADHD has a sibling that has a risk for substance abuse, then you're at least considering and safeguarding the way in which that drug is going to be safeguarded in that household. Locked box, uh, uh, limited supplies, whatever it is that's going to help you do that. Okay, So methylphenidate and the derivatives of methylphenidate are a very common option, Ritalin options. This table gives you a number of products that are on the market that relate to that, some of which may be in short supply or not covered by the insurance. We ideally, though, usually prefer for a once-a-day dosing form. You can dose in the morning. You don't have to deal or want to have to deal with having a second supply sent to school, having a kid's backpack. Uh, you know, you just really would prefer a single dose in the morning kind of agent. Here's another table of these. This table includes the once a day long acting methylphenidate derivatives. There are a lot of them. Here are some of the amphetamine containing products. There are many of them. And again, the biggest issue I think of when I compare one agent to another, not only the dosages that are available, but ideally you really want to go with a once a day dosing regimen. Uh, which is the bottom half of this table. When you're considering something that is a non-stimulant, the agent that's probably been historically used in the last 20 years uh, or so is uh, adamoxetine or Stratera. Stratera was pretty popular when it first came out for ADHD because it's not a stimulant. Uh, it works in norepinephrine transport. Uh, it's not a controlled drug. But it had fallen a bit out of favor because of the risk of hepatotoxicity. I think that risk is monitored carefully now, and I think we see a little more use of Stratera now than we might have seen when there was more concern for this hepatotoxicity a few years ago. Let's look at the other non-controlled drug treatments for ADHD to wrap up our ADHD discussion. Uh, Stratera is one of them. The other two that I think we'll see, and these, the other two are particularly considered in younger children often as a first choice, is a long-acting formulation of clonidine or guanfacine. So uh, these may be more appropriate for use in patients with a, younger patients as a first trial before you go to a stimulant. That's a consideration, and there's some reasonable data for these. Okay? So... Uh, I'd encourage you to work. I don't work personally with a lot of ADHD when I'm in the acute care hospital with adults. Occasionally, we see adults come in on an ADHD med, which we try to continue or look at how that's interfering with the chief complaint, which usually isn't. Um, you know, if they come in with a cardiac event history or question for their admission, then we're probably going to stop the ADHD med until that gets clarified. Um, but uh, I don't have a lot of experience here, so I would defer you to get a broader sense of wisdom about management of ADHD from 
your other colleagues, both in the didactic year and in your clinical year, and then in your clinical practice arena. Okay, let's talk about another topic as we're talking about stimulants is the question about obesity. Uh, and the reason I talk about obesity and stimulants is because at least historically, those were the primary agents we had to manage people who had obesity when you wanted pharmacologic management. There's a lot of data on obesity, and this is a change, changing landscape, particularly with the new diabetic agents, uh, the SGLT2s and the GLP1s that have been available that are associated with significant weight loss. You know, those are clearly used in patients who uh, have a type 2 diabetes and a need to lose some weight, and we talk about that in the endocrine block. Um, but they may have their role even for folks who don't have diabetes, certainly illicitly as of mid to late 2023, we see a lot of chatter about patients who are using these agents for weight loss. So the, the, the jury's still kind of out about where everything fits. What I've included here is a subset of slides from a not-for-profit organization, Obesity Medicine Association, which has done a decent job at sort of outlining some key points. And they have many, many, many slides, and I just selected a couple of them that I thought were pertinent to the topic of uh, trying to lose weight. So they recognize that obesity as an issue is a health issue that has a lot of confounding variables to it. Um, and we are concerned primarily with obesity and its impact on both physical health and to some degree mental or behavioral health as well. Um, and so all of what we're looking at is to look at primarily the first two options here at the bottom uh, are nutritional intervention and physical activity. But that said, a pretty important component is both motivation and behavioral therapy and looking at the options that people can use to try to lose weight. So let's talk about nutritional intervention first. Nutritional intervention is pr pretty much going to be a look at both the constitution of the diet. You know, is it a lower carb diet? Is it a lower fat diet? Is it a fat intermittent fasting? Is it a paleo and or ketogenic keto diet? Uh, is it a uh, Mediterranean diet? Is it a DASH diet? They're all different data for which of these nutritional interventions make sense or don't make sense. And you can make an argument for any of them. So I think clinicians are beginning to see, okay, uh, there might not be a particular advantage of one over another in the general population, although I think for, for folks who limit carbs and or do more ketogenic kind of diet, they often tend to lose weight more rapidly initially. But those diets and their diets have to become lifestyles that are sustainable for individuals, and that's not always easy for anyone to do. Um, Secondly, is increasing the degree of physical activity. Uh, and those go hand in hand, physical activity and nutritional intervention, both for the types of foods people eat, avoiding processed foods, uh, and trying to have the right balance of carbs and uh, uh, fats and proteins, uh, are, as well as physical activity, are the p pillars of good cardiovascular and endocrine therapeutics. Okay, so we talk about that a lot. The third is behavioral therapy, and this comes in lots of realms. I think anyone who is trying to lose weight is probably frustrated in that they've tried to do it multiple times. They might have lost weight, then they plateau, and then they gain it all back. They lose their sense of strength and will to continue doing it. Uh, I don't want to really use the word willpower per se because there's a lot of factors that affect that. But understanding why people eat and how they eat and what are triggers for people to eat and what are stresses for people to eat are an important consideration. So behavioral therapy has gotten a pretty uh, higher profile look in the last decade or so. Certainly programs that have run around for a long time, like Weight Watchers, have a behavioral therapy component in the sense of you know support meetings, support groups, internet-based kind of work. Uh, one of the other sort of bigger players in the last uh, couple of years has been Noom, N-O-O-M, which is looking at really behavioral therapy and understanding why people 
eat the way they do. Okay? So those are the pillars. The fourth is pharmacotherapy. Pharmacotherapy has a role, but let's, as we talk about the role, the track record that we have seen as clinicians over the last decades with pharmacotherapy for obesity management is they typically only work while the patient's on the therapy, and when you try to wean them off the therapy, many times if you have not done the first three issues, nutritional, physical activity, behavioral therapy, and sustained it, uh, the weight comes right back. So pharmacotherapy is not really a first-line option for us, uh, nor generally should it be. The only time we're going to say that is when we talk about diabetes, where we may choose one of the agents that does double duty for type 2 diabetes as well as obesity. And finally, bariatric procedures, I'll leave that to your ClinMed folks, but the bariatric procedures are really kind of the last step, but not unheard of doing. And then all of the issues with these have to do with, you know, what's sustainable, what's, uh, what's covered. Um, the, so the management is the coordination of all of these uh, intervention options that you have. And the options are pretty much start with lifestyle is the first thing. Lifestyle plus meds. Maybe considering a very low caloric diet, like 800 calories a day, that's pretty drastic and very hard for people to sustain something like that. And finally, bariatric procedures. The Obesity Medicine Association has come up with sort of 10 takeaway messages for anti-obesity meds. Uh, and they're listed here. I'm not even going to spend a lot of time going through them. I'll, you can go through them at your leisure if you'd like to. But for the most part, as I think about the medicines, anti-obesity medicines, just keep in mind that most of the data we have over the years with these meds is that they work in conjunction with the other modalities, but when you take the medicines away or go to try to take the medicines away, the weight often comes back. And so you really need to do the foundational things as well. Uh, and we'll t there's a couple of tables I had that talk about some of these agents more specifically. Uh, the anti-obesity medicines uh, are used as an adjunct to physical activity and nutrition and behavioral therapies. They are not standalone, uh, and you will particularly find them helpful when you've tried those three nutritional, physical activity, behavioral therapies that haven't worked, uh, and you recognize there's a medical benefit for a 5 to 10% weight reduction. The only thing I'd say the exception to this uh, where medicines aren't, again, an adjunct might be in type 2 diabetes where we talk about the SGLT2s, GLP1s as a mainstay of our therapeutic options. Uh, but everything else just for obesity without type 2 diabetes, uh, these agents are really uh, second line or additive adjunct therapies. So there are some agents that are FDA approved for short-term use and some medicines that are approved for longer-term use. Again, some of these have been around for a long time, uh, but the data, again, with almost all of them, it's limited for when you, while you're on them, but when you come off, not. The specifics for the description, the main side effects, and other concerns are listed here. Uh, fentiramine or fentiramine derivatives, it's a, it's a psycho uh, sympathomimetic amine, it's a stimulant, it's a Schedule IV drug. Uh, it is associated with some benefit, but a lot of side effects. And really, I don't think there's a lot of folks in this day and age who are now using it the same degree where we saw it used even five years ago. The second is Orlistat. Orlistat is an inhibitor of uh, absorbing dietary fat. The big problem with Orlistat is that it, it has some weight loss associated with it because it interferes with the absorption of fats. That causes really two problems. One is you may decrease the absorption of fat-soluble multivitamins, uh, but secondly, you may find patients who have stools that are fatty and or end up with diarrhea So uh, that is, or gas. So that really renders Orlistat often intolerable. Um, the third agent set of agents are the, uh, the GLP-1 and what's not really listed in, uh, in depth here are the uh, uh, GLP-2, the 
glucose transporters uh, agents as well that are associated with some weight loss. They, there's really almost no question that if a patient has type 2 diabetes and falls into the ADA guidelines for their use, those are going to be first-line therapies. And, you know, many of the patients you're going to have who have obesity uh, have type 2 diabetes already. I think what we're trying to figure out is we now use metformin, and actually metformin is associated with some weight loss to some degree. Uh, metformin may be an option that's considered. Um, but, uh, you know, particularly in prediabetes, but the role of SGLT2 and GLP-1 agents in prediabetes has yet to be established by the ADA. I wouldn't be surprised to see that happens, but it is not the state of, the, of, of practice right now, okay? Then a couple other things out around the market are combinations of bupropion and naltrexone. That's been around for a while. If you have someone for whom bupropion as an antidepressant makes sense, boy, that might be a great thing to consider, okay? So if you've got uh, depression for which bupropion is not contraindicated, remember we worry about seizures, insomnia, anxiety, uh, that can sometimes become worse with that, but that might be a reasonable option. Uh, and then there's a combination of fentermine and topiramate, uh, which is an anti-epileptic drug that has shown some benefit as well. Uh, and so, uh, again, those might be considerations. But those, for the most part, are the treatments for obesity. Very good.